In God we trust. In the consumer, not so much. Today we're talking about the Federal Reserve and inflation and the stories that we tell. Jerome Powell came down like Moses on high to testify in front of the Senate Banking Committee, as he's required to do at least twice a year. Powell is an extremely savvy politician in addition to being a well-respected official. And we've talked about Powell's reputation before and his ability to bring warring factions together and calm a room. Nearly everyone on the committee in the two plus hours of testimony was polite and deferential and thanked him for his steady hand. Strike that, all but one of the questioners. Chair Powell, you are gambling with people's lives and there's a pile of data showing that price gouging and supply chain kinks and the war in Ukraine are driving up prices. You cling to the idea that there's only one solution, lay off millions of workers. We need a Fed that will fight for families. And if you're not going to lead that charge, we need someone at the Fed who will. As usual, Senator Elizabeth Warren used her time to drive a stake through the idea that economic progress must always come at the expense of the working class. She pulled no punches during her allotted time pressing Powell on this perspective. Most of the other questioners fell unsurprisingly along party lines, though shrouded in civility. But Warren's remarks stood out for their pointed hostility towards Powell and the worldview that guides the central banking system. Now, before we get too far into the weeds on the hearing, I think it's helpful to review exactly what the Federal Reserve does, because its very existence is mired in controversy. At any given time, the Fed can find itself in the crosshairs of groups all along the political spectrum. One of the most popular refrains from libertarians, for example, is, end the Fed. Likewise, it was adopted by many on the left, especially during the Occupy movement. I don't fall into the end the Fed camp, by the way. Because the alternative is either what we had prior to its existence, which is economic catastrophes nearly every other year, or Bitcoin, which is what libertarians advocate for. So here's an overview, mostly courtesy of the St. Louis Fed, on what exactly the Fed is and does. The Federal Reserve System is overseen by Congress, but it operates with a great deal of autonomy. There are three parts to the Fed, the Board of Governors, 12 regional reserve banks, and the FOMC, which stands for the Federal Open Market Committee. The Board of Governors oversees state chartered financial institutions and bank holding companies. The regional reserve banks distribute currency to the banks, lend them money, and process electronic payments. They also conduct research and report on regional economic issues and trends to help keep the finger on the pulse of the different parts of the country. The FOMC is the main body that determines monetary policy. Now here's the most important thing to know because you'll hear this a lot when you watch or read anything related to the Federal Reserve. The Fed has what is called a dual mandate from Congress. This is a statutory mandate that requires the Fed to make decisions through a very specific prism. The first is called price stability, basically to manage inflation. The second is maximum employment. As the St. Louis Fed describes it, the concept of maximum employment can be thought of as the highest level of employment that the economy can sustain over time. In terms of the Fed powers and the dual mandate, here's what the Fed does and is capable of. First off, it sets the baseline interest rate for the nation, the federal funds rate. This is the rate at which commercial banks lend to one another. This is important. It's the rate that all others are based on. For example, prime rate usually runs about three points higher than the federal funds rate. As of this recording, for example, the federal funds rate is around 4.5% and prime is 7.5%. Mortgage rates today are in the 6 to 7% range as well because the Fed has pushed the federal funds rate so aggressively. So you can see how directly this impacts consumers on a significant portion of household expenditures. The Fed also has the ability to purchase investments. This is usually referred to as adding to the Fed balance sheet. And this was one of the primary levers that they had during the financial crisis as an example. The Fed bought everything from treasuries to toxic assets in order to flood the market with liquidity and prevent financial financial institutions from going belly up. This was referred to, rather elegantly, as quantitative easing, and it's something Jerome Powell has been slowly reversing in order to restrict money supply. So that's it. Even the Fed characterizes itself as a blunt instrument because of the limited amount of tools in its toolkit. But there's no question that they have some of the most powerful tools in the world. 
So let's kick this off with a senator that I despise. It's a little long, but super important. So stick with it and we'll chat on the other side of it. I'm not trying to trick you. You're raising interest rates. You're raising interest rates to slow the economy, are you not? Yes, to cool the economy off. Um, and one of the ways you measure your success, other than fluctuation in gross domestic product, is the unemployment rate. Is it not? Yes, one of the measures. Okay. So in effect, this, I'm not being critical. When you're slowing the economy, you're trying to put people out of work. That's your job, is it not? Not really. We're trying to we're trying to restore price stability. No, um, you're trying you're trying to raise not, not the wages. you're trying to raise the unemployment rate. There are and, a lot, so there are a lot mean, of that mean I know you don't like the phrase, so let me strike it. You're trying to raise the unemployment rate, are you not? No, we're not trying to raise it. We're trying to realign supply and demand, which could happen through a bunch of channels. Like for example, uh, you know, just job openings. All right, job let me, openings. Let me could, put it another way, okay? The economists did a, did a wonderful study. They looked at, at, at 10 disinflationary periods in America going all the way back to the 1950s. Disinflation is what you're trying to do. It's a slowing in the rate of inflation. Am I right? Yes. In other words, prices don't go down. They just don't go up as fast. Deflation is when prices actually go down. You're trying to achieve disinflation, are you not? Yes, we are. Okay. Based on history, in the 10 times that we got inflation down, disinflation since the 1950s, in order to reduce inflation by 2%, unemployment had to go up 3.6%. Now, that's history, is it not? I don't have the numbers in front of me, but yes, the standard has been that there have been recessions and downturns when okay. the Fed has tried to reduce inflation. Now, right now, the, the current inflation rate is 6.4%, and the current unemployment rate is 3.4%. Now, if history is right, I'm not asking you to, 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 again, blame anybody, but if history is right, unless you get some help, in order to get inflation down from 6.4%, to let's say 4.4 percent, and the unemployment rate is going to have to rise to 7 percent based on history. That's what the record would say. Okay, so that's Senator John Kennedy from Louisiana, who has perfected the art of bless your heart, Southern charm, while sticking a knife in your spleen. His questioning was really interesting because it started off along party lines. It's before this clip, but he tries to honeypot Powell into a fiscal conversation around government spending, but Powell doesn't take the bait. Basically, Kennedy, along with the other Republicans, tried to score highlight reel points by criticizing the Biden administration and government spending, but Powell handily manages each of them. So Kennedy switches gears and goes right at the blunt tools in the Fed arsenal to elicit the response that you just saw. Every questioner from the Democratic side pretty much drove the same lane, which is why I wanted to show a Republican hammering at this point. Powell returns over and over to the idea that it's all about price stability. The price of goods and services must match what we're able to pay or the economy is out of balance. Totally fair. But remember that he only has a couple of ways to impact this equation, one of them being interest rates because it squeezes the economy. The reason interest rates have such an ability to tame inflation is because it throws an economy into a recession at a certain point. It makes everything more difficult. Mortgages are more expensive, so home buying slows down. People stop spending money and start saving it because they can get a better rate in the bank. This takes money out of circulation and slows spending in the economy. It makes borrowing of all kinds more expensive, especially in the corporate sector. So all the deals that are done with debt begin to look a little less attractive and mergers and acquisitions slow down as well. That's the solution that Powell's driving at here. But that doesn't address why we have inflation in the first place. Senate Banking Committee Chair Sherrod Brown opened the proceedings by talking about the root causes of inflation in an attempt to set the table for the hearing. Take a listen. No matter what goes wrong in our economy, a global pandemic, a war in Eastern Europe, weather disasters, profits somehow always manage to go up. Workers are left paying the price. As you've noted, Chair Powell, the Fed's tools are only one element in our fight against inflation. It's a complex problem. Interest rates are a single we know blunt tool. 
Raising interest rates can't rebuild our supply chains and fix demand imbalances from the pandemic. Raising interest rates won't end Russia's brutal invasion of Ukraine. Raising interest rates won't prevent avian flu from devastating one third of our egg supply or weather disasters from destroying key crops. And raising interest rates certainly won't stop big corporations from exploiting all of these crises to jack up prices far beyond the increase in their costs. Interestingly, Powell never capitulates to this concept, meaning he never reveals one way or another anything about what he believes to be the root cause of inflation. For all we know, he believes and understands that inflation is due to latent supply chain shocks, the war in Ukraine, and corporate greed, as pretty much everyone else in politics, economics, and the thinking world knows at this point. But all he has to fall back on is the dual mandate. You see, he knows that he can tame inflation. If he gets the interest equation just right, the country will go into a mild recession, and about 2 million people will lose their jobs. And the process is to raise rates, reduce the Fed balance sheet, which takes some money out of the system, and increase capital requirements so banks have less money to lend and invest. Powell is probably not a bad dude. He's just a robot with a couple of tools at his disposal. Watching the hearing, it became evident that he doesn't relish this position. He's resigned to it. It's his job. He knows it will be hard, but it must be done. But does it really? This is about the stories we tell, the myths and legends that persist over time, like the idea that students are too irresponsible to have money in their pocket because they'll buy drugs. The direct child tax payments instead of credits was the perfect example. We now know that people paid down debt, bought food, and caught up on rent with that money, and it lifted millions of children out of poverty in a matter of a few months. So what did corporate America do? raised prices on literally everything across the board, and they took that money out of the pockets of everyday citizens and moved it into their own. And then who gets the blame? The citizens. The blunt focus on beating back worker gains and low unemployment ignores some hardcore realities about the labor market, and we've talked about this. In fact, it came up and was even acknowledged in the hearings. After the devastating loss of life during the pandemic and the influx of newly retired boomers, the number of available workers declined. Add tight immigration policy to the mix and it only exacerbates the situation. Powell himself pointed to a natural cooling of certain aspects of headline inflation like rents cooling off and supply chain issues easing. And yet, he persists with the narrative of the dual mandate and the blunt tools at his disposal. So here we are. For all the collegiality and respect on display at the hearing, the subtext is troubling. For all the talk of independence, and I can't believe I'm gonna say this, I actually wish Biden would channel a bit of Trump here and start rattling some cages over at the Fed. Remember when Trump browbeat the Fed into holding rates because of his precious stock market, the only thing that he cared about? Well, Powell positions inflation and wage growth as a Sophie's choice, saying, quote, strong wage growth is good for workers, but only if it's not eroded by inflation, end quote. And technically, he's right. But by correlating the two in every way, he's taking blame away from the real inflation culprits and hanging it around the neck of the working class in this country. That's why, for all the so-called independence of the Fed, it doesn't mean that the Fed can operate in a silo. Fiscal intervention by the government to crack down on profiteering will have a far greater and more positive impact on inflation than creeping rates that squeeze the poor and middle class. Powell isn't wrong about the Fed's mandate and its ability to quell inflation, but it doesn't make him right in using the blunt tools at his disposal to do so. Oh, uh, one thing I almost forgot. Okay, so book love for this episode is Narrative Economics by Nobel Prize winning economist Robert Schiller. This book explains how certain narratives like the wage price spiral take hold in our consciousness and are then baked into policy. It's an incredible resource on multiple levels. All the other sources are linked below. And for the full podcast that goes into even more depth on the hearings, head to unftr.com or download the show wherever you get your podcasts. And here endeth the lesson. <laughs>